Hello, good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining our session for today. This is an initiative of the Covenant Nation HR Community Group. And we have quite a number of community groups in the Covenant Nation. My name is Oli Emeat Biosham. I'm your coordinator, MC, anchor for today. I'm not the facilitator. We have brought someone way intelligent, way competent, way qualified. Someone has the experience and the exposure to do justice to this topic. All right. And we are starting right away. We just have one or two minutes for introductions, and then we will unveil the guest speaker, even though she's not a guest. She's also an internal resource, internal resource. She's one of the leaders, specifically the leader of the visionaries set of the HR community group. And the visionary set are generally HR practitioners or professionals who have 15 years and above or within that same range. I was part of that group last year, last semester, and I learned a lot, networked a lot, and I'm still in touch with my colleagues from that group. Welcome to this session, Emotional and Political Intelligence Masterclass for HR. Okay, so let me just welcome everybody right now. We have about 33 people on this call. All things being equal, we expect at least 100 anytime from now. So reach out on your HR professional platforms or HR community group platforms share the link, share the WhatsApp. Intentionally and deliberately, we have opened this up to everyone in the HR fraternity. Okay, there is love in sharing. And the Covenant Nation is a faith-based Pentecostal Christian church seeking to help people develop their careers in HR and engage actively within the HR community in Nigeria and of course beyond. All right, we welcome everyone. And our arms are open wide to support everyone in their growth and professional development. You are welcome to join us whenever we have our meetings online, virtually, at any of our centers, any of our services. Nevertheless, please do not feel pressured to attend. We love you absolutely. Okay, so this is a cross section of some of the HR professionals in the HR community group today. This is just about 20 of them. And some are members of the Covenant Nation. Some are non-members. We even have some that are even non-Christians because we throw open the community program to everyone just to be a blessing to touch 
someone, I hope some of the people you can see on this picture are actually on this call right now. So let's go right away. Let me read the profile of the speaker to you. And you can also follow, check your phone, your device, your laptop, whatever system you are joining this broadcast from. Eitayo is an organizational psychologist. She's a human resource management specialist and an ICT project manager with 23 years experience in project management, training solutions, software sales, operations, and organizational development. Eitayo started her HR career in recruitment for the federal government in 1998 proceeded through learning and development, and has since worked in organizational development, performance management, and HR software solutions. Her career success includes setting up training academies across Ghana and Nigeria for one of the world's largest software companies, building transformational programs for employees of some of the largest organizations in Nigeria, are managing key relationships for a global brand at C level. C level means chief, you know, chief, chief financial officer, chief security officer, chief human resource officer, just for the benefit of somebody on this course today. Eita works in the project team of the leadership development program for the British Psychological Society Division of Occupational Psychology in 2016 and has acquired CPD. I believe CPD must mean credit you know, for professional development in employee engagement, relationships at work, and assessment center management. She has a, a master's in organizational psychology from the prestigious University of Manchester, United Kingdom. She is certified in ability and personality testing and project management. She is a certified life coach and cognitive behavioral therapy practitioner. She is a member of the Life Coaches Association of Nigeria and the British Psychological Society. Until recently, Eita Yosab as Chief Operating Officer of Nigerian Internet Registration Association, which is a platform that manages Nigerians' country's quote top level domain. She established Whetstone Coaching as a one-stop shop for women's mental health in 2018, and the organization has batted four principal projects today. She is the managing partner and chief experience officer at Talent Urbanity, which caters to human resource development needs of organizations. The chief specialization, among others, include selection and assessment, training, health, safety, and environment, and performance management. Eitayo is a follower of Christ, a believer in his redemptive work on the cross, and an enthusiastic minister of the world through teaching and drama. I hope we see some of both today. She is a mother of three, even though she doesn't look it, and an ardent reader, a budding author, I look forward to reading her book this year or early next year. One of her poems has been published in an international anthology. With joy, with excitement, with warmth and applause. I told her before that I will bring her again. Thank you for obliging. Please let us celebrate as we receive the ministry gift of Eitayo. Eitayo. Welcome. I hereby hand over control to you. At this point, I will stop sharing so you can share your screen if you have one. Welcome. Yes, I do. I do. Good evening, everyone. Thank you, Oluyemi. Look, Oluyemi has this way of introducing you. I am wondering if you are still the person that is being introduced. God bless you. Thank you for all that you do. You know, it's it's quite quite a bit to. Um, do what we do, leading the community groups along with our work. Thank you for following up with all of us. Thank you for putting this together. Thank you to everyone who has taken time today to join. 
um, it's always a pleasure to share. You know, I always tell people I straddle HR and technology, and it's such a strategic place to be in these times. And I'm really blessed to have the opportunity to do what I do. Good evening again, everyone. Uh, this place looks a little bit dark, but it's too late to go and put on extra lights now. I apologize. I hope that you can see me well enough. And um, it should go. So <laughs> when Oliyemi gave me this, okay, well, he, he listed a number of titles, yeah, topics and said, okay, leaders, I want people to teach these topics. This emotional intelligence is right down my alley. I do a, I do a lot of work in EI. So I, I took it and this is, this is so me. So this evening, I think that you, it's a great opportunity for all of us again to revisit our own personal lives. So when we hear that this thing pertains to work, there's a tendency for, did I say good evening? Ah, good evening, everybody, forgive me. I went straight into it, right? Good evening. I hope you have had an amazing day. When we hear emotional and political intelligence for HR, in our minds, many of us come and sit down with a pen, a notebook and paper, ready to learn something for the workplace. But as I always tell organizations, it is people who make up the workplace. It is people who make up organizational culture. It's people who create these things. When we say relationships at work, we're talking about the relationships between people. So you're going to need emotional intelligence in your public and private life. So I just want to put the caveat there. So you're not sitting down there thinking, okay, let me just pick the notes for my organization. This has nothing to do with me. Don't be detached from what we want to discuss this evening. I think that every one of us has a lot to gain. My name is Eitayo. So I wanted to start by reminding everybody, in case you might have forgotten, that the H in HR actually means human. Yes. But you see, human also stands for choice, for individuality, for growth for community, for respect. And I want to start this class by asking, in your mind, when you think human, what comes to your mind? I'm gonna quickly read them out in the chat room. Quickly go and let's see, what comes to mind when you think human? You're in HR, you're practicing in HR. What comes to your mind when you think human? Complex? What? Type, type, type. I'm waiting to see. Empathy, emotional being, thank you. I like those. Feelings, excellent. Who else, who else? Let's go, let's go, let's go, let's go. Quickly participate. Let me know that you're in this class. Free moral agents, very important to note in HR. Diversity, vulnerability. Thank you, KG. Nice to see you here. Down to earth, unpredictable, personal idiosyncrasies, collaboration, problems. I like that. Thank you for being honest. <laughs> Complexity. Okay, here we go. All right. So thank you for thank you for sharing. Thank you for participating. Let's see how many other polls we'll do while we're at it. So um, when we talk about HR practice, sometimes we forget that these are not just numbers. They are actually individual human beings. Every security guard, everybody in the clinic, every officer, every manager, every intern, every youth call member, human beings, complex beings, but amazing, amazing potential to become anything that we put our minds to be. So if we remember that the human in HR, the H in HR means human, human, you know, and look at all the words that have been typed. I can see some people are still typing. All the words that have been typed to describe the experience of human, our humaneness. What is it that makes us human? Why are we the way that we are? And a few people have put some things that I like the person that said problem. Okay, so let's look at what HR does. So we, we say, we, we throw this, we bandy this word, so, but what, what does HR do? HR does HRM. So let's break it down. Human resource management is the organizational function that manages all issues relating to the people in an organization. I can just stop there because Many times as HR, we're so worried about the reports. We're so worried about the structure. We're so worried about the processes that we forget about the people. And we are HR, human resources. And what we do is human resource management. 
So let's look at a few. It includes, but it's not limited to compensation, payroll, payroll, total cost to company, all that. And, and sometimes again, when we think about payroll, for example, when we're recruiting, we tend to forget insurance. We forget pension, we forget, you know when you calculate TCC, and you're not doing it in a holistic manner. So HR is very, very important. HRM, the process that we manage is key to the organization. Performance management, who says that this person must leave because the person was not able to make it in this role? Do we have square pegs in round holes? How many times do you go around and look at the employees in an organization and give them an honest, objective appraisal? How many times do you look at succession planning, review it and see whether you're still keeping to it? How many times do we look at a seeming high performer and, and then to the detriment of everybody else on the team, encourage that person until the person leaves and leaves the organization in the lurch? These things happen in HRM. Organizational development, safety, wellness, benefits, employee motivation, communication, policy, administration, and training. These are all in your purview. But remember, you are dealing with human beings. So it's very easy to put all this into a nice structure. I have a policy, it works excellently. I just need everybody to tick the box, tick the box, tick the box. You want to take leave, oh, okay, go and fill the form. And you can just deal with them like numbers. You know how we have employee number now, you know your number in your organization. So there's a way that we do people and then we treat them like statistics. I'm hoping that at the end of tonight, you will move from that place of treating people like stats. So let's talk about the leadership part of HR. And that's, that's where I want to take the conversation from today. HR is leadership. We cannot forget HR is human resource and HR is leadership. The reason why HR is leadership is because HR drives all the human policies and no organization is anything, at least not now, maybe in the next 10 years, who knows? You might have an organization that's totally run, totally implemented, everything is done by AI. Until then, we have human beings who need to actually perform the tasks that you need done. So generally, uh, Benny says that leaders share three fundamental traits. And I want to talk about the three because it leads into the conversation that we are about to have. The first is a guiding vision or purpose in the sense that a leader has a clear idea of what he or she wants to do professionally and personally and will pursue the goal regardless of the setbacks. This is good. And sometimes in HR, this can be a challenge. You want to manage change. You have decided that this is what the organization needs irrespective of what the networks, and we're going to talk about networks later, irrespective of the feedback that the humans, remember that H, in the organization give you, you are intent on pursuing that track. All other departments can do that. HR may not survive if HR does that. So when you think about a guiding vision or purpose, I want you to think about a guiding vision or purpose for a people strategy. For a people strategy. HR drives people strategy. So don't think about the, them as numbers. Think about them as human beings. So you see those numbers, it doesn't matter how high the numbers, whether you are 55,000 people, you are talking about 55,000 human beings. The second thing that it is said that a, a leader exhibits is passion or enthusiasm and the ability to communicate that passion to others. You know, every time I meet an HR manager, somebody who's working in HR, who does not know how to connect with people, before the, the first assessment, you know, I can tell that this person really needs to grow their, uh, emo their emotional intelligence. They really need to grow into the role that they have taken. So you might have chosen, you want to do HR, you really want to bring change to pass. You want to ensure that organizations succeed in the human resource management. You do, you have a heart for it. But if you don't have the passion or enthusiasm that drives that ability, then it might be difficult for you. So this evening, we want to talk about emotional intelligence and I want to lay this foundation so you understand that HR's leadership even though it is leadership, HR is driving the organization leadership 
in human resources. These human resources are not just about the number, they are about the human beings. And so all those words we list listed at the beginning, those words relate to, they are ways of describing human. So the experience of working in HR is kind of unique. It's different from every other experience. And I know somebody will tell me, oh, but every, every unit in the organization is different. Well, human resources is about ensuring that the organization actually is able to do what they say they want to do with the, by the work of the people that they have put in place to do it. The third aspect, the third trait that leaders are said to share is integrity. And there are three parts that I really want to talk about. Self-knowledge, candor, and maturity. And I'll break it down. Self-knowledge, know thyself. What are your strengths? What are your weaknesses? It is common for me to go into an organization, sit with HR and say, I want to see a SWOT. I want to see your personal SWOT. Everybody on this call, make sure you sit down and do a SWOT, S-W-O-T, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. And do a SWOT regularly. As you deal with your threats, as you take advantage of opportunities, your landscape is changing. So make sure that you are regularly updating your own personal SWOT. Make sure that you have the chart and you're looking at your growth and you are mapping it. Do not leave your growth to chance. Don't just sit down and think, okay, well, they said HR grows through level one, level two. And then after like 15 years, I become CHRO or maybe 20 years, I don't know. Self-knowledge, where are your strengths? Where are your weaknesses? Now these strengths and weaknesses will come to play when we start to talk about emotional intelligence because there are tendencies. So if you think about the five groups of the five groups of personality types that that everything now is based on neuroticism, agreeableness, openness, um, conscientiousness. I can't remember them now, but five you know big groups. And then everything that we're doing now, the thirty two groups are based on those big five. We call them the big five personality traits. Now, if you consider that. And you consider the mixes that are possible, the, um, the number of iterations that are possible in those groups, then it will make sense to you that you need to know yourself. Because if you don't know the things that trigger you, for example, okay, I'm going ahead of myself, let's come back here. Candor, being honest with yourself. You know, we have a way of lying to ourselves. It is, it's something that we do without even thinking about it. The worst kind of lie is the one you do to yourself. You see, it's, it's actually, well, it's not good to lie, but it's, it's actually safer when you're lying to someone else. When you lie to yourself, then you have crucified yourself. You have put yourself in a, in, a, in a box that is going to be very, very difficult to get out of. You know why? Because every time someone is giving you feedback, you have a block because you think that you know. The third thing is maturity. Without maturity, you cannot practice HR. You cannot always think that everybody's after you. You can't always think that, um, oh, you, you, you never do right. You can't have all those um, <clears throat> challenges that are drawn sometimes from past experiences, you know, so they are valid. They are valid, but they need to be dealt with. In order to sit in the place of HR's leadership, you need to grow in these three areas. You need to learn to be truthful and not servile, you know, you're not coming with a pitiful um, mien to the table. So let's look at the a, one of the sets of people's skills that I, I found this on workable.com and I thought, yeah, it fits what we want to, the conversation we want to have today. So we look at organizational skills, time management, records management, calendar management. We look at communication skills, clear writing, critical listening, conflict management, confidentiality skills. Many people want me to put this in block letters. I mean, non-HR people, because they think that HR just goes around talking about the things they hear. I hope you don't. Discretion, ethics, trustworthiness, and then adaptability. Change management, big picture thinking, self-assessment and improvement. It is interesting that self-assessment is listed as a critical skill in human resource management. If you don't know yourself, then you cannot, cannot manage other human beings. And we'll see why when we start to come into 
emotional and political intelligence, I thought we would never get here. Awesome. So when you look at that primary skill set and everything that we have said up till now, it is clear that emotional and political intelligence have a huge impact on all primary skill sets. There is something that you need that emotional and political intelligence will impact. And all those things are critical skills for success in HR. It, it's going to be almost impossible for you to talk about trustworthiness if you don't understand ethics, if you don't understand discretion. You may not understand discretion if you don't understand some aspects of emotional intelligence. And so when, when we start to talk about the impact of emotional and political intelligence on primary skill sets in HR, then it begins to strike you that the conversation is incomplete. The skill sets are incomplete if you do not have ample knowledge of emotional and political intelligence. So I thought I'll add this, this is my personal thoughts. So if emotional intelligence is the key, don't ask me the key to which door. We'll talk about the door at the end. Political intelligence is the door handle. So you know, door, it's one thing to turn the key. It's another to bend the handle so that you can go in. They go hand in hand and HR just cannot do without them. So let's look at the concept of emotion, the concept of emotion. And I'm just gonna take a minute and look at the chat box and see what people are saying. Oh yeah, the five broad personality types. Thank you, Asuko, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Happy to connect, happy to connect. Okay, so good. Thank you for, yes. The five, the big five, yes. Extroversion or extraversion, agreeableness, openness, conscientiousness, and neuroticism, the big five personality traits. Thank you for putting that there, great. So let's look at emotion as a concept. In psychology, and you'd have heard I'm a psychologist, I'm one of those born psychologists, but I have a degree and master's to boot, so you know, I am a psychologist through and through. I love people. In psychology, emotion is defined as a complex state of feeling. Note the word complex. We bandy, oh, he's very emotional. Oh, she's very emotional around. We tell our sons, and I need to divert a little to that point. We tell our sons, oh, don't cry. You're not a girl. And we tell our daughters, eh, go and sit down and cry somewhere. We use emotions. We manipulate such a complex um, concept. We manipulate it to our own detriment. And we manipulate it for so long that it is difficult for us to connect with our emotions. When we are done today, I hope that you will go and actually spend some time and connect with your true self and find out who you are and find out what kind, how do you wear your emotions? How do you deal with your emotions? What happens when you are in pain? What pain have you carried from the past? I'm a psychologist, I have to have this conversation, pardon me. So emotion is often defined as a complex state of feeling that results in physical and psychological changes. The word physical, you can, you can replace it with physiological and psychological changes which influence thought and behavior. And I'll give you an example. If somebody walks into the room now, and yes, the door is that way, and raises their hand, like, you know, they, they make as if to slap me. Before I think about the response, my body will respond. My brain has learned, my mind knows that when a hand is coming for some reason, the hand is coming to cause pain. And because we are built to self-preserve, many of our intuitive responses are not thought out. You need to understand the power of your emotions. And it is not crying or not crying, smiling or not smiling, no. You can actually be someone who never cries and you have serious, severe emotional, in fact, you obviously have severe emotional problems. So it is not the exhibition of the emotions that, that describes the concept. The concept itself includes what is exhibited, what causes it, what the thought is, and what the behavior is. And it is a very, very interesting concept. I need us to embrace this concept in order for us to get the best value we can from this session. 
So let's look at some of the emotions that we, you know, some of the basic emotions that we see. Excited, ecstatic, energetic, aroused, bouncy, nervous, perky, antsy, tender, intimate, warm-hearted, scared, tense, nervous, anxious, jittery, frightened, angry, irritated, resentful, miffed, mad, upset, furious, raging, sad, down, blue, mopey. Did you see that I did not consciously change my look? I said sad and I actually felt sad. It is interesting how the mind can be tricked into these responses. And if you do not understand emotions, you can very, very well totter on the brink of an emotional breakdown and have no idea about what is going on with you. So no aspect of our mental life is more important to the quality and the meaning of our existence than our emotions. Emotional intelligence, therefore, so, so if the emotions are this important, then emotional intelligence, which was coined by Daniel Goleman, I think in the 80s, I remember now, but emotional intelligence is the ability to recognize, understand, and manage our own emotions and recognize, understand, and influence the emotions of others. So it's two pronged. Most people look at emotional intelligence like I'm emotionally intelligent. I don't even get angry. No, 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 that, that's not it. No, even the Bible says be angry, sin not. So your emotions are valid. It is the management of the emotions that creates a problem. I'll say it again. Your emotions are valid. They are driven by changes that have happened in your thought process. They are so quick so quick that when you hear news before you are able to um you know fully grasp it tears are running down your eyes you, you have responded even before the reality of that has has you know been grasped so if emotional intelligence relates to the recognition the understanding and management of our emotions the recognition the understanding and influence of the emotions of others, then obviously if we're talking about humans, and that is what HR does, isn't it? That's where we started from. We deal with the human resource of an organization. Then a conversation about emotional intelligence is a must have. Now, how is emotional intelligence an asset? The ability to manage my own, the ability to influence that, that, the emotions of others. How is it an asset? Now, individuals with high emotional intelligence are observed and measured as having, so I've put the um, links there so that you can go and read up on it, even though I've taken quotes from those pages, but I think it's important that you actually go and sit down and study this because you work in HR. I guess that's why you're on, on this call. Individuals with high emotional intelligence are observed and measured as having higher productivity they are better at conflict resolution and they build strong bonds with coworkers as they can more easily understand the desires and needs of other people. Does that sound like HR to you? Do you know, when I read this, I was like, uh -huh. it's HR now. Uh -huh. So higher productivity. We not only have, we also drive higher productivity. Conflict resolution. Is it not on your table that it ends? And then bonds with coworkers. We're going to talk about networks and bonding later. So these are core to what HR does in an organization. Suddenly, it, it you know it becomes obvious that EI, if you are emotionally intelligent, is an asset to you in human resources. Most people make mistakes. Are Travis Bradbury is an, a LinkedIn influencer. Go and follow him. I follow him. I've followed him for years. And he's a, he's a big influencer. He's one of the people I, I respect a lot when it comes to talking about talent and talking about HR. So go find him on LinkedIn and follow him. Say thank you later. Most people make mistakes around emotional intelligence because they don't understand what's going on with other people. Your, in a, your, your capacity to live in a bubble is a major flaw in your success in life. You cannot succeed if you live in your head. So most people think that if they have dealt with their emotions, that is emotional intelligence and we'll get to that. And if they have already done that dealing with emotions and it's okay, it doesn't matter what anybody else thinks. 
they don't necessarily understand what is going on with themselves. I read it again. Most people make mistakes around emotional intelligence because they don't understand what's going on with other people. They don't even necessarily understand what's going on with themselves. We have a challenge there. So you don't understand what's going on with other people. And then fundamentally, you don't even understand what's going on with you. So it's going to be difficult if HR, the H is human, and human beings are all those words we have listed. And then you don't understand what's going on with yourself. You want to try and understand what's going on with other people. There's a place for stepping back. For those of us that practice as coaches, as therapists, and so on, we always have to step back. We always, do, you know, sometimes you see somebody who is self-destructive. You know that this is such self-destructive behavior and you still need to step back because the person needs to make a choice against that behavior. The, the, the person, if the person doesn't choose, it doesn't matter how, you know, how good you are, the person needs to make a choice. It's so difficult when the person doesn't have enough information to make that choice. It becomes a real real, real challenge. I'm going to take a moment, read the chats and the boxes. The LinkedIn influencer is Travis Bradbury. Oh, thank you so much, Arosa. Thank you for sharing that. Awesome. So everybody, you can also follow Daniel. Daniel Goldman is on um, LinkedIn. I follow him as well. So these, these are um, thought leaders in emotional intelligence. Okay. So now let's go into the meat. And I know that... Um, I know that's only, um, don't worry, I'm, I'm on time, I'm on time, all is well. So let's talk a little bit about emotional intelligence itself. So I've given you quite a bit of foundation, of a foundation, and um, this is so that the conversation about emotional intelligence can sit well. You can orient yourself properly around the concept of emotional intelligence and understand what you need to do to become more emotionally intelligent. And all of us are, I mean, I remember when I certified in EI, Ha. I sat in that class and I was thinking, ah, hey, Tayo. hey you are lost. Oh. Ha. I had so many aha moments, honestly. And I had worked for what, almost 20 years at the time. And I still, I didn't even realize I wasn't emotionally intelligent. You know, so for some of us, we might need to add a certification, you know, to, to be able to practice well with human beings. If what you want to do is work with human beings, then knowledge of emotional intelligence is not negotiable. All right. So there are more components, but most people agree that these four are the distinct and the most relevant components of emotional intelligence. Self-awareness, social awareness, self-management, and relationship management. So most certifications will sit around these four. And I just want to talk about the four. So let's talk about self-awareness. Being able to identify your motivators, your emotions, and your triggers. I mentioned triggers earlier on. Many of us don't even know. So when you get, excuse me, when you get upset that something has happened, what exactly is upsetting you? Do you ever sit back and ask yourself, what was upsetting about this situation? Particularly if, like me, you live in Lagos. I mean, I was driving two days ago, and from about two streets from my house, I had already started, what's he doing? What's that? And then I said to myself, no. You know, when you start, I, you start commenting or responding to external, um, external triggers, then you need to ask yourself, okay, what exactly is it? So I thought to myself, okay, what is it? And then I thought, oh, okay. I was fasting, it was a very sunny day. I was thirsty, I was tired. And then I said, okay, so breathe, eat. I, I am not saying that those people were not doing crazy things. Heaven forbid that I'll say so. I am saying that I govern my response to what they are doing in order to self-preserve. So emotional intelligence means understanding your triggers and being able to put yourself in a way that you manage them. The second thing you need to do is accept yourself for who you are. So I have a bit of a... Yes, 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 I'll send the slides. I'll send the slides. I have a bit of a, and I don't know how you'll get the slides. Interest. I'll send them to Uluyemi. I, I don't know how he's going to send because I can see there are 92 people on this call. But the slides, yes, I'll make the slides available. So 
accept yourself for who you are. Now, most people take this to mean, this is just how I am. Do you hear people say that? This is just how I am, you have to live with me. This is just how I am. The most self-defeatist statements, one of the most self-defeatist statements you can make is, this is just how I am. Human beings change. We were created to change. Adaptability is ingrained in us. That's the reason why something happens to you the first time. By the time it's happening the second time, alarm bells are ringing because you, you've identified it. You understand what's going on. So accept yourself for who you are is the foundation for moving to where you want to go. But not even accepting yourself, telling yourself lies and not accepting yourself for who you are is a recipe for disaster. The third thing is strive to become better daily. So you understand what I was saying in accepting. Make sure that every day you tell yourself, okay, I'm going to improve this. I'm going to be intentional about growth. I cannot even tell you how intentional I am about growth. Today, I registered and attended a course because I thought I saw a gap. You know, I took a decision and I thought I didn't have enough information when I took that decision. So I went to look for what information, where the gaps were. I identified it, I did a gap analysis, and then I went to look for the knowledge. And I'm going to test it in the next few days. So you, 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 you're never too old to learn, you're never too old to grow, and you must continue to grow. When you stagnate, you die. And I may not be talking about physical, biological death. When you stagnate, you die. We're not designed to stagnate. We're designed to grow. You can go and read the parable of the talents for the Christians and understand what I'm saying. The fourth thing, area of self-awareness is understanding your personal strengths and weaknesses. I mentioned that before. If you work in any area, not necessarily in HR, in any area, and you do not understand your personal strengths and weaknesses, you have already basically failed because then you don't understand where the triggers are. You don't understand the things that you, you may not be able to deal with. So sometimes we start a project that we cannot finish because we didn't understand our personal strengths and weaknesses. And I'm not saying that there's anything, excuse me, there's anything that you cannot do. I am saying in order to do it, you need to build the skills to do it. In order to build the skills, you need to know that you already do not have the skills. And so you need to understand your personal strengths and weaknesses. All right. Now let's talk a little bit about self-management. Learn to control your emotions and behaviors. That word control should be manage because many people read the word control as shut it down. That is not it. You shut it down for many years. It becomes an albatross it's hanging on your neck. Don't react emotionally to changing circumstances. And I'll tell you a very interesting story. Something happened last year. Let me break it down. I've been talking for so long. Let's take a break. So I was going downstairs on a rainy morning and I fell down the stairs and broke my ankle. And I was sitting on the floor, it was raining and nobody could hear me. My neighbor who wanted to drive out was sitting in her car and nobody could hear me. And I was shouting, the kids were upstairs, nobody could hear me. So when everybody finally heard and they came downstairs, I mean, the, the foot was broken, it was hanging, I broke my ankle. So I have a metal plate in it. And um, my neighbor came, you know, she, she called her husband, he rushed and, you know, came and, with a balm and thought maybe I twisted it. And I showed him the way it was hanging, the way the foot was hanging. And he looked at me and said, Madam, you don't break leg before. That was the first time I was breaking a bone. But if I started screaming and shouting, what would it serve? My heart would start to beat faster and the bleeding that I had already seen because the foot was growing, you know, so I knew that there was bleeding internally. Whatever was happening in there, I would have aggravated it by the time I start screaming, I increase the adrenaline and the cortisol in my system. Then the body starts thinking, fight or flight, what has happened? What should we do? What should we do? And then, you know, I now have the negative effects of what has happened in, in addition to whatever had already happened. So, I mean, I, I sat down there and I smiled to myself and I thought, oh my goodness, oh my word, I have grown. I have grown. I'm sure that there was a time, I don't know when, it, was, it must have been long ago, when if that kind of thing happened, I'd have been like, yay, yeah, no, my food is hanging, no. I mean, you know, and many of us are like that. Don't react emotionally to changing circumstances. Hold on, wait, make 
an intelligent judgment. What, how would I like to react? If you just pause a little, give yourself two minutes, you will be able to make a logical, reasonable response to whatever might have happened. And it doesn't matter how powerful the circumstance is, you can choose your response to circumstance. But if your response is always emotional, hey, you cannot be trusted because emotions can't be trusted. Develop mental resilience by study and mindfulness. So mindfulness is key. And I, I hear a lot of people say, yeah, mindfulness, maybe it's Asian, some kind of meditation, whatever. No, no, no. Mindfulness is being aware, being critically aware of where you are, what is happening to you at every point in time, such that you can guide your response to what is happening to you. That's mindfulness. Yeah. And you know, I, when people ask me, oh, you're a Christian, and then you talk mindfulness, I ask them, what does the Bible mean when it says, if your eye be single, if the eye is single, the body will be full of light. That's mindfulness. Focus, focus. Balance priorities and commitments. Many of us are overstretched because we are committed everywhere. You already work, I wanted to say nine to five, eight to four. In Lagos, it is actually five to Ten, maybe. So let's, you know, typical working day in Lagos. When do you get home? So you already work that much. Then on Saturday, you pack your bag and go for a wedding in another city. On Sunday, you are in church. After church, you are visiting somebody. You are never home. So you don't have a life. Balance priorities and commitment. If you want to grow, you need to commit to time to grow. If you don't commit to the time you need to grow, you're never going to grow. That's just the truth. So you need to balance priorities and commitments. Don't stretch yourself overly. Make sure that even when you stretch yourself, you are stretching yourself for something that is, you know, <laughs> something that is critical to your growth and not over something that you're doing to try and please somebody. Don't even let me go there. Implement cogent growth strategies. Have a strategy for your growth. Where do you want to be in two years? Where do you want to be in three years? What, what is your ultimate plan? Okay, in HR, what do you want to go into? Generalized business, business partner? What do you want to do? So take those decisions now, find mentors to guide you, and then listen to what they say. Then many young people come and say, oh, I want you to mentor me. The very first thing you tell them, mm, you need to think through this. Or they say, no, ma, I've thought about it. In fact, I've discussed it with XYZ person. But why do you bother? It's either you want a mentor, because you're willing to put your foot in where their foot was and learn from the size of their footprint. Or you don't want a mentor, you want to run it like the rest of us did and run it and God will grant you grace anyway. But you need to decide. And then create a monitoring framework for success. I tell you, look, one of the most foolish things to do is to say I'm growing and not know by what measure I am growing. Year on year, how have you improved? Week on week, how have you improved? I assess myself by the day. What did I do today? What did I achieve? I have a list at the beginning of every day and I try to keep to it. And on a day that I have not been able to make that list, I create time early the next day and I start on that list. I try to finish it. And you can imagine, I work for myself. So, I mean, for some of us, what, what stops you from creating a monitoring framework for your success? Let's talk about social awareness. And this is key, very key for HR. Well, everything is key, but this is very, very key for HR. Recognize emotional cues, excuse me, in others. So important that you recognize that by the time the person's tears are rolling down, the emotions that brought the tears have passed. When somebody is speaking and their voice is raised, it's an emotional cue. What are emotional cues? Recognize them. So when you manage a group of people, they're so diverse. That even five people are diverse. I mean, look at your mother's children. That gives you a good example. So when you manage, I, Deborah, I can see your hand, but we're going to do questions later. I, let me just follow my train of thought. Or you can type your questions into the chat box. Okay. So if you recognize emotional cues in others, you are better able 
to influence them and guide them appropriately. Empathize with others. It, you cannot successfully practice HR without empathy. You cannot. You have to be able to empathize. You have to say to yourself that I can put myself in these shoes. Look, I tell people sometimes, you see, when you're screaming at someone, so you live in, say, Suruleri, and you work, say, Marina, but you have an employee who lives in K2 and needs to come to the same Marina, leaves his house at 4.30 a.m., maybe, I'm just, I'm just, you know, citing an example, maybe leaves his house at 4.30 a.m., and then you keep them after work. You don't release them early. You release them at 7 p.m. You get home at 9. They get home at 11, and they need to leave home at 5. You don't have empathy. You will work that person until they fall ill. The person will become cranky at work. The person will start to exhibit emotional behavior at work. They're not sleeping enough. They're not resting enough. And there's a lot of that. HR needs to be empathetic. So you need to empathize with others. And this is primary for social awareness. You need to understand the dynamics of power and influence in a group. And we're going to talk about that when we start talking about political intelligence. You need to understand the dynamics of power and influence in a group. People think that power is only the person who speaks. And so they are quick to speak. Every You want your opinion must be heard all the time. I used to be like that once, believe it or not. I used to think, eh. This I have to say, uh, well, whether you agree or not, I have to just say my mind, you know, sometimes the most powerful people in the group are the silent ones because they listen to everybody, they take stock, and they're able to now present an aggregated view of what everybody is saying, which nobody else can see because everybody's too busy pushing what they think is their own perspective of what should happen. Become aware of your personal, so this is mindfulness of your personal surroundings, your audience, and your environment. It is so important that you do that. If you are not mindful, the world will run away with you because people will hit you. People will consistently do stuff, not because they necessarily want to deal with you. They're just being themselves. But in being themselves, sometimes they hurt you. And if every hurt, everything that someone else does, you think it's about you, you have a problem. Because they have a life, they're living their own life, they're doing their own stuff. So you need to be aware of your personal surroundings, your audience, and your environment all the time. I remember a story that was shared once, and I won't tell you who, who was talking to truck drivers. And he said, uh -huh, and you know, when the rubber hits the road, your truck drivers looks at themselves. Rubber hits road. Being able to understand your audience means being able to change your language. Part of social awareness is to be able to have a conversation depending on who you are speaking with. You have to develop yourself to be as comfortable speaking the Queen's English as speaking broken English or pidgin English, if, if you call it that. You have to be. So the, your, your, your strength is not only that mm, I speak Queen's English. Your strength is also I feel breaking down if I need to. Anything where I suppose talk, as I feel talking the way where people go take understand what I mean when they talk. So you have to develop yourself to be able to do that. You have to be, develop yourself to be able to understand culture, cultural nuances. You can't say ah why. I can do anything I like. You cannot. Cultural um, intelligence is a major, major factor in emotional intelligence and that's social awareness. What is your environment? Where are you? You know, you're traveling sometimes and you see people wearing bomb shorts to travel. And then you wonder, you know, it is culturally inappropriate. And this is not even a religious anything. And it is just culturally inappropriate. That's all I did. So you need to understand your environment. You need to learn to adjust to change. We're here again. Change. When change comes, don't, don't, you see, if, if a force is coming, and I, I studied science, interestingly, in school, even in the university. So 
So if there's a force that is coming and my hand stands against the force, it's more painful for my hand. If the force comes and I shift my hand, there's less pain for the hand. Learn to be adaptable. Learn to take change in your stride. Learn to build adapting mechanisms so that you can grow. So that when things change, you are ready to be modified, to move in line with that change. Use your influence for meaningful, positive impact. Stop joining the people having conversations, you know, clicks in the organization. You don't need it. You are HR. You can't afford it. Even if you brought someone in, the person or the person has grown to become your friend and confidant, you must still be objective. So you have to be able to maintain such influence as to be deemed meaningful, positive. So let your impact be positive and let your impact be meaningful. I'm just going to look at the chats. Oh, thank you very much. God bless you. All right. Relationship management. Ooh. Okay, so you need to develop your sphere of influence and use it well. Ha! If you don't know how to use networks properly, if you don't know how to use connections with people, and I'm not talking about calling people and asking them to bend the rules for you. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about using other people's networks to grow. We are such and we have become, we didn't used to be, pardon me, We've become such an entitled nation that every time you meet people, what's in your mind is, what can I gain from this person? And if, if those gains were growth, it would have been better. Sometimes the only gain is, uh, please give me a note to somebody so that I can get a job or give me, you know, all kinds of things. Influence is, 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 um, is derived from value. You get influenced because you add value. So ask yourself, what value do I bring? Always ask yourself, what value do I bring? And if you don't bring value, step back and check the sphere that's your influence. Because in fact, the, the, the challenges that we have in our nation is about people not being able to use their sphere of influence properly. What's your sphere of influence? Have you identified? The people that you can tell to match and they'll just get up and go. Do you have them? Do you know them? If you don't bring values to their lives, then it's not going to work. Learn to communicate effectively. Say what you want to say, how you want to say it. As we've gone on this presentation, you've seen me halt and think about the most appropriate word to use. Be careful. Understand English. Speak it properly. This is our lingua franca, at least as of today. So if you work in Nigeria, I don't know where else you work. And or, you know, all over the world where you may be, whatever the language, the business language of that place is, you need to learn it. I remember many years ago, we had a project running in Lume, in Togo, and I needed to go there and spend some time with the project team. I had already done a baccalaureate, one of those French stuff, but I didn't use it. And so my organization had to send me to business French school. I had to learn business French. And, I, you know, I walked in there thinking, come on. Huh? Business French was a totally different kettle of fish. Because now we're talking about graphs, about, you know, we're talking technical. And suddenly all my French went down the day. In fact, by the end of the first day, I was almost crying because I was feeling like I didn't know any French at all. Communicate effectively. Take time to understand what the people who are listening to you, what they need to hear so that they can do what they need to do. Develop positive relationships. As a rule, do not only want people that you can push their heads and treat them anyhow. Have networks that are positive as well. Evaluate your friendships regularly. Look, there are friends you have had since primary school. They have just become baggage. You drag them along. There's nothing you're doing with them anymore. Let them go. It's okay. It's okay to find new friends for the level where you are. You see, when Lot, you know, Lot's men and Abraham's men started quarreling, Abraham said, eh, eh, there's no need. You choose which side you want. Go, oh, it's fine. You have to be willing to evaluate friendships from time to time. You have to be willing to find mentors and mentor others. The reason why we are here on earth is impact. 
Otherwise, and I'm a Christian. As soon as you give your life to Christ, you just go and start praising the Father with the four and 20 elders. We are here because of impact. What impact are you making? Day by day, is it only about what you eat, what you drink, what you wear, what you, you know, your day is about you. No impact whatsoever. So finding mentor is a problem. Mentoring others is a challenge as well. That means you need to build relationship management. And then you need to build trust and credibility. Now let's come back. So we've broken down emotional intelligence and we spent quite a bit of time, I apologize, but I'm looking at the time. So let's recognize that emotions are created when, it, so I spoke about this earlier and we're back to it now. Emotions are created when the brain interprets what's going on around us through our memories, our thoughts, and our belief systems. This is so key. Recognize your belief system. Look, many of us, when we want to cook, even though we're using no cubes, we call it Maggi. Why? We grew up at the time when Maggi was, by the way, I don't do that. We grew up at a time when Maggi was the, I don't know, the, it was the stock cube of the nation. And I'm talking as a Nigerian living in Nigeria. Over the years, we've had Royco, I don't know, doing cubes, whatever has come up. And we still call all the stock cubes Maggi. This is the subconscious effect of suggestion. That is influence. And if you don't understand what suggestions you have absorbed, you will not understand why you have the value system that you have and why you have certain emotions, even when you don't need to. You know, has someone ever done something and moved and you start thinking, are they doing that because, and the person did not even see you. It's a belief system that you have that you need to cope with. Now, the interpretation that we make to the things that go on around us is what triggers the way we feel and how we behave. We must understand that all our decisions are influenced by this process in one way or the other. So the earlier you become emotionally intelligent and learn to understand your responses to certain things, the earlier you will become a better HR practitioner. Now, different emotions affect your decisions in different ways. Fear affects a different way. Anger affects a different way. Joy affects a different way. So you need to understand, excuse me, you need to understand these effects if you are to make sense of the practice of human resource management. Emotions affect not just the nature. So we've been talking about the nature of the, the actual decision that you're making. What about the speed with which you make that decision? Remember I talked about pause? Just take some time, just, just don't respond yet. Just wait, you know? I, sometimes I can be very uncomfortable I think to live with because I can I can be quiet for you know a, a whole day. My my thoughts are deep and I am in my brain. You know I'm I'm praying. I'm I'm focused on something. I'm looking for an answer. You won't see me participating. You know all kinds of conversations around the house. I won't. I want my brain to stay in a particular place and I keep it there. I keep my thoughts focused there until I'm sure where I want to go, what I want to do, and I take a decision and I start writing. So be careful that you understand that your emotions will affect not just the nature, that's what decision you make, but the speed of the decisions. The angrier you are, the more you want to lash out immediately, the more you need to pause. Now, your gut feeling, it means that this is your gut feeling. This, I just, the way I felt, eh, I had to respond to that guy. That feeling plays a huge part in your decision-making process. And if you don't fix your thoughts, if you don't fix your interpretation of issues, it's going to be very, very difficult for you to grow in emotional intelligence. And that in itself leads to poor judgment and unconscious bias. You don't know why you don't like this person. You just don't like him. You just don't like her. I just don't like, I, have you, I, haven't you seen people like that? They tell you, I don't know. He didn't do me anything. No. I don't like her. I don't just like her. You should sit back and ask yourself why. Something as, you know, when I talked about memory, something as mundane as the guy is wearing a shirt that somebody wore on the day that something bad happened to you around you, your brain has linked that image with the pain. And so every time your brain sees that image, your brain triggers the pain. 
I hope you understand what I'm talking about. There is so much about us. We are so interesting as human beings. I, I think psychology is the best course to study in the world because human beings are, you cannot finish. You cannot, you can know them you, every day. Every day I sit with somebody and I see them, you know, like change. I see them adapt and they are, you know, they come first, they come to me in pain, you know, dejected. And then in six weeks, in 10 weeks, I can see the transformation. I am in awe of what the human brain is capable of. You should be too. And that should make a big influence in how you manage the people as a human resource management practitioner. So how about political intelligence? We've said a lot about emotional intelligence. How about political intelligence? Oh yeah, Indomie too, that's true. We call all noodle packs Indomie, even the Chinese noodles, Indomie. <laughs> I, to tell you the truth, I don't buy any other word, but I mean, yes, we call them all noodles, Indomie. And so many detergents, Omu, you know, so. so Let's talk about political intelligence, but I want to take a 10 minute break and see if you have any questions. Is there anything that you want me to talk about? Or you want me to revisit as we're talking? I'm hoping I don't see any hands up and, and I can just continue. Yes, I can continue. Thank you. Yes, I can. Cool. Any questions? No, I don't see any questions. Okay, so what about political intelligence? You know, what is it about political intelligence? What do we talk about? What do we mean when we talk about political intelligence? Let's go and see what it is. So there are multiple perspectives from which we can view. You know what I said about adapting to change? When I sat here, the air conditioner was on. In the period that we've been here, power has gone off. And now I'm wiping my face. Pardon me, but we have adapted. Mm, pardon me. So we can look at political intelligence from multiple perspectives. The first perspective is as ideology the political ideology. And this is the idea of politics as we know it, the practice of politics. I don't know about you, but in 2015, was it 2015, the last election, sorry, 2019. Yeah, 2019, the last elections, you know, organizations had to deal with serious ideological arguments in the organization. I don't know about your organization, but some organizations had to make rules about discussions that couldn't hold. But this evening, we are not going to talk about the ideology aspect of political intelligence. Then there is PQ, which is political quotient. This is the leadership capacity to interact strategically. That's government, business, and the wider society. So the, the, the point, the meeting point between government policies, the way you run your business, and what the society would like to experience as your business, that middle point is called PQ, and it's actually a thing. And you can go and read up on it. And that's not what we're focusing on this evening. Behavior, political intelligence as behavior, is the use of power and social networking within a workplace to achieve changes that benefit the organization or, I'd like to add, and or, the, it could benefit the organization and individuals within it, but most of the time, it will benefit either the organization or the individuals, depending. So let's focus on behavior. Now, I'll define it again. It's the use of power and social networking within a workplace to achieve changes. So first of all, there are three areas for me that are key that you need to be conscious of and you need to manage if you want to benefit from being politically intelligent as you practice in HR. The first is structure. The idea of organizational structure for some people is a no-go area. Look, this is how they drew it and that's a, that organogram. Sometimes you recognize that the organogram as is may actually be feeding some of the distrust within an organization. And you would need to actually think about what you want to do in terms of the structure, how you want to manage the implementation of the structure 
of the organization. That is very, very key. That is so important. You have to be able to manage the organogram in a way that makes sense. You have to be able to do that. So if you think about structure and you think about the organogram and you think about reporting lines, then you know the, the idea of politics and of course politics, there's politics everywhere. The idea of sociology, the way that people interact. So I know that as nations and globally, the concept of politics has been abused for many of us, but politics is actually an integral part of human engagement. We are political animals. We think about groups, we think about leadership, we think about approach, we think these are concepts on facets of politics. So, so considering your, your structure, even HR. Okay, so let's talk about HR as part of your structure. When HR wants to draw structure in organizations, many times they take L and D, compensation, recruitment. What else does your organization, I mean, so let's, let's chat here. What else does your organization break it into? What are the HR units? What are the HR units? Share with me. What HR units are in your peculiar organization? So I've talked about learning and development. I've talked about recruitment. I've talked, and these mostly, you know, larger organizations. Industrial relations. Thank you very much. Industrial relations is key. Performance management. Thank you. Welfare. These are units that organizations have. Now, what? What happens is that each of these organizations needs to engage payroll. Thank you very much. Talent acquisition, organizational development, L&D, employee welfare, health, safety, and environment, talent management. What happens is that these, these units for the organization, they are distinct units. For many of the practitioners of HR, each of these, it doesn't, it doesn't make for good practice for each of these units to engage with every single employee. So many HR units have a help desk. And it is this help desk that sifts the requests and looks at what is required and what is not required, and they are able to help and support. These, of course, I'm still talking about really large you know, enterprise organizations. When you want to visit structure, you need to understand that our political behavior must be considered in a conversation about the structure within. Thank you, scholarship. Oh, wow, you talk, you work for a big organization. That's interesting. So what do you do when organizational structure feeds political turmoil within your organization? You must be, become politically intelligent. You have to recognize which point so there's an assessment that we usually do for organizations where we look at um, the functionality of your organogram. And we advise you, you know, based on the people who sit in certain roles, you might want to change the title of the role. All this goes into political intelligence. Have you seen organizations that have internal titles and external titles? So when you're out, you call yourself a particular thing. When you go in, you call yourself a particular thing. So, or particular role, you name your role in a particular way. So think about it and, and consider that political intelligence helps you structurally make your organization stable. And this is within the purview of HR. Let's look at networks. Many organizations that we go and work with tell us about cliques. They'll tell you that, oh, there are caucuses. I don't know how to deal with them. If you do something, this caucus goes against you. That caucus, lack of recognition of networks is lack of political intelligence. Political intelligence means being able to identify all the networks within the organization and knowing how to use to balance your engagement, use your relationships with those networks to grow, to move the organization forward. If you ignore the networks or sideline the networks, then you are caught in trouble. And most likely you will have a situation where you will need the influence of these networks. Organizations that have um, labor, labor units under them, you know what I'm talking about. So those are some of the, within the organization, within that labor unit, there are 
cliques and caucuses. And you need to be able to engage. Yes, they don't know what they have until they ask mm, those that know. That's, that's interesting. Somebody just put it there. You see, if you understand the networks, then you can come to their level and see from their perspective. So as HR, sometimes you need to sit in the chair. That's the empathy. You need to sit in the chair. So if all the, let's say you have knowledge, you have knowledge as part of your units in the organization. And let's say you have truck drivers all over the country. You, before you make any major changes, recall that these truck drivers, many times they're out. The changes meet them on the road. They hear about them. If you haven't carried them along, you're putting your organization at risk. As um, you may think non-critical as they are, I think they're critical, but maybe in some organizations you would consider them non-critical, but you know, driving a truck is not something that you, it's not a, a skill you pick up on the street. It's something that grows over time because there's security, road networks, so much knowledge that they have and it's not easy to replace them. But you have to understand the networks that exist within your, and it is not a bad thing. So that's, that I, I really need to point that out, that politics within an organization is not negative. It becomes negative when we do not approach it with political intelligence. Understanding the networks and being able to empathize with the networks does not mean that you will necessarily do everything that the networks want. It just means that when you're building your policy, when you're building your change, when you're building your engagement, you are thinking about how they are perceiving it. And that helps you for success. So you will not come and implement some change that is gonna be over the heads of the people. You won't do that. Then relationships, these are key. And this is another place that I think that um, blind order, interesting. This is another place that I think that you, you would have um, emotional intelligence, political intelligence, but also capacity, growth capacity inside you. You would have to become a master at managing people socially. So yeah, I mean, social awareness is part of emotional intelligence. I'm talking about even having conversations. You see, many times HR practitioners are finding it difficult how to stay in between being too nice and being objective. And sometimes, I mean, we're human. Sometimes you can't but cry with the person who's sitting in front of you who has just lost a child and is looking for more time. You, you, you may not but get upset at someone who's been bullied at work, you know, because you are human. So you will have those responses, but being able to manage relationships objectively is key to your capacity for success as an HR practitioner. And so when we focus on political intelligence as a behavior, these three structure, how, is, how are the people engaging? What are the kind of you know, lines that you have? Do you have dotted lines? Do you have thick lines? How do you run them? The dotted line managers, how do they relate with their subordinates? The managers that have the thick lines, what kind of information do they require? This is political intelligence. And I mean, I've had those lines before and sometimes they are a little bit tough to navigate. Networks, what are the units that exist? How do they perceive your, your practice of HR? Who needs you the most? When do they need you the most? What are the arguments that you can create in the office of the CFO, in the office of the CEO that are critical to organizational growth because you are politically intelligent? and then relationships. How politically intelligent are you to understand when people come and speak to you? <laughs> Sit back, That's so bring emotional intelligence in. Listen to everybody, but sit back objectively and look at the points that they have given you. So if you have a whistleblower, for example, who identifies themselves, you, you should ask yourself, that's political intelligence. Why blowing this whistle? What is to be gained? And I'm not saying that whistleblowing is bad or wrong. I'm just saying that political intelligence means asking the right questions of yourself, understanding how people behave, 
and how they may behave in certain situations and circumstances and being able to manage that. That is political intelligence. Without understanding and being able to manage the structure, without understanding and being able to manage the networks, without understanding and being able to manage relationships, it may be very, very difficult for you to successfully practice human resource management. So what can HR do? What can you do? We talked so much about emotional intelligence and political intelligence and all the things that you need to do. And so I need to break it down, um, give you some points aside from everything we have said. The first thing I want to say is build mental resilience. So I like to describe resilience as, you know, when you pull a band, you have a rubber band. When I stretch it and I let it go, it comes right back to how it was. It doesn't change. That is my best way. That's the way that I describe mental resilience to people. It doesn't matter what is thrown at you. You maintain a stoic resolve, like that's fine. If, if, if you have pers personal issues that you haven't dealt with, it's going to affect your capacity to practice HR objectively because you are already sad or angry or upset from home. And then you sit down and the entire organization comes and drops all their problems. It doesn't matter which unit you are sitting in. They drop the problems that pertain to all the human beings in that unit on you. And you need to work through it. And you need to work through it objectively. Remember the conversation we had about bias. It's going to be very difficult for you to be objective about the decisions you're going to take in that circumstance. So build mental resilience. Grow emotional intelligence. That goes without saying. Go back and look at yourself. Self-awareness, self-management, relationship management. What are you doing to grow in those areas? Maintain fairness and justice. This is so key. You have to be able to stand tall within the organization as human resource and say that we are fair, we are just. And be careful with politics because politics is one of the things that tamper with your capacity to be just and fair. Organizational politics. Nurture positive networks. Ensure that you, you, you know, you. In, within those networks that exist in the organization, you engage such that you can influence positively, very important. Make sure that you are influencing positively. Eschew fair. Do not sit down and think that, oh, if I take this decision, these are all the things that could go wrong. Because sometimes, as my coach says, you enter into analysis paralysis. And then you, you analyze so much that you're not able to move. And so you don't move. And so the organization doesn't move either. Make sure that you face your assignment with dignity, with pride, with honor, with integrity. And then of course, when you do all that, then there's no fear. Many times that I engage in tough situations in organizations, HR has cowered. Particular networks or particular caucuses have pushed HR into a corner and HR is now looking for external help to be able to manage that relationship. Don't do that. This is your place, stand in it. As we will say in Nigeria, Gidigba. Stand where we and take it. Learn the art of negotiation. An immature person says it's all or nothing. Is this, this is how it is. A mature person understands that human beings change. Human beings are adaptable. And so human beings can be made to do what they're supposed to do if the right approach is employed, use the right approach. And then maintain social distance. I added that there, in fact, I put a smiley before. What do I mean? There are many organizations, well, not many, there are one or two, maybe they're not that many, where I've gone and one of the complaints against HR is favoritism. And I, I see this a lot actually. And although HR will justify some of the decisions they have taken because they have information which the rest of the organization doesn't have, and they are able to therefore take that decision, the fact that this person is perceived to have favor with HR sometimes already mars your capacity to make an objective decision. Do you know that sometimes you can push the decision to someone else, to the line manager, for example? 
because of your relationship with that particular employee. There are very creative ways to manage relationships within organizations, use them. Make sure that you apply those creative ways to manage those relationships. Now, this is the doorway I was talking about. Remember that slide when I said that if emotional intelligence is the key, then obviously political intelligence is the door handle. Well, HR leadership is the doorway to organizational development. And if you don't have the key and the door handle, it's gonna be very, very difficult for you to grow and help the, your organization to grow to the level that it would like to grow. Most importantly, for you to make sure that productivity in the organization is top notch because you are sitting in the human resource management seat. This is extremely important. I hope that you have learned something. I hope that I haven't been boring. I hope that I haven't piled too much on you. And I think that, Oluyemi, where are you? We can um, work on questions, a few questions now. Yemi, 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 I'm looking for you. Okay. Thank you so much, Eitayo. I dropped a comment in one of the groups where we are mutual members that Eitayo is indeed a bomb. Thank you so much. I've been tremendously impacted by this session. And I must say, I've seen quite a number of uh, senior HR professionals on this call. I I'm tempted to mention names, you know, but I don't want to err on the side of not mentioning people. I've seen uh, HR directors from multinationals on this call, big organization and I have a feeling that one, the quality of the topic, two, the personality of the speaker that has graciously, you know, made herself available. This is politics. Thank you Political so much. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. So, so Thank soon. you. Thank you very much. So I Thank think you. we can take um, questions. We can also take feedback. So if yes. anyone would like to um, share, I either ask a question or you want to share a CM feedback or just share one or two tips, for example, how you are in a political situation at work and how you emerge. We would like to also draw one or two, you know, leverage on some of the personalities we have in the house. Okay, you can also type in your questions or your comments. We are going to be here, worst case scenario, 9 p.m. That's our standard exit time, worst case scenario. It can be earlier. Um, thank you, is saying super duper session. Chisholm is saying thank you so much, ma'am. The presentation was awesome. You see, Maria says thank you for the session. Olumura says she's our leader. She came to support her and learn from her again on this platform. Daniel says, I love your conclusions, ma'am. So Chuku says this was awesome. Okay, so Bukola is asking a question here. What do you do when employees confide in you about some decisions they have made and they don't want you to speak about it? E.g., they are deciding to resign. How should this be handled? Itayo, a question for you. Okay, so what I, so one of the first things I tell HR is, look, the organization pays your salary. And it doesn't matter how empathetic you are, the organization pays your salary. Now, somebody who is about to resign is actually about to put the organization in a critical situation. And so for you not to tell would be going against what you signed, your employment letter. You are HR. It is your job to make sure that you protect the organization, even as you protect the, um, the employee. And so if an employee tells you something, Usually at sea level, there's a level of confidence. Oh, sorry, I'm sorry. There's a level of confidentiality that exists at sea level in all organizations where you can have that conversation with the CFO and the CEO so that you, as you are responding, because obviously if you've heard that an employee is leaving, you will start making plans to respond to that that gap that is going to be created. How are you going to recruit somebody if you don't get approval 
from the CEO. So you have to be able to say, look, don't tell me if you're not yet ready to go. And they have to know that you are HR. HR does not mean I'm employed by the people or any other thing that the people think. HR means I ensure that the organization can get maximum productivity from the people that it has. And it cannot get maximum productivity if you hear stuff that can put the organization at risk and you hide it from the organization. So I think that is quite straightforward. Thank you so much, Eitayo. So one of the meaning of C-level is confidentiality. Omolara Yekuria says, well done, Eitayo. All is exciting listening to you. Moranike um, says, this is a great session. I love the aspect of political, you know. Now we have a question from Onyekachi Jones. But before I read that question, somebody sent me a question via private chat. And the question is, what do you do when your CEO does not trust the HR? What do you do when the CEO does not trust the HR? Okay, so I've seen that in a few organizations and it derives from one of the things we've discussed, which is that HR has taken decisions in the past that tell the CEO that uh, the decisions have told the CEO that HR is not to be trusted. So what has happened, what happens every time that trust is eroded and um, the trust needs to be rebuilt. So what I would say is HR needs to find the point at which trust was eroded and then have an intentional plan to rebuild the trust. You would have to go and have all the CHRO, whoever the most senior person is, if the organization doesn't have that role, needs to go and sit and have a one-on-one, -on -one, one. Two, HR needs to involve the CEO better in the decision-making so that the CEO understands that they are on his side. HR can actually make or mar the, the success of a CEO. So it's important if the CEO distrusts HR, then HR has to fix it. The onus is on HR to fix it. The onus is on HR. And I am not excusing the situations where CEOs come with a notion that HR is about the people. And so HR will always side the people. I don't want to talk to HR and I have seen that situation before. So that one has to be careful as well. So if you have that kind of CEO, then use a lot of graphs, use maths, use statistics. You know, don't, don't let the argument be, this is how I feel. As much as possible, make sure that the discussion has some kind of graphic so that you are bringing, it seems like a business case, you know, make sure that you can apply your decision to the business and that will help the um, CEO start to trust HR. Thank you so much, Eitayo, for that apt response. So let me quickly take Oyekachi's question before it throws a dagger at me. And his question is, what is the best strategy to get through or handle a workplace where psychophancy and boot licking is a big thing, I service. I know, and that, that happens a lot. And I'm not sure I know the answer because we work in a society where I service and psychophancy is generally accepted, unfortunately. So the first thing I'll say is make sure that you are not accepting it or feeding it. And I'll give you an example. I once worked in an organization where people had the habit of coming to say good morning. Now, sometimes they say good morning and then the, the assignment that they're supposed to submit that morning, they haven't submitted it. And one day I said, okay, you know what? I, I don't need you to come and say good morning. You know, I really, do. It, it means, it doesn't mean anything. And I'm not saying that in a rude manner. I'm just saying you really don't need to go around saying good morning to everybody if you haven't produced the work you're supposed to produce. So the first thing I want to say is HR, don't feed it and don't accept it. And then having said so, don't exhibit it either. HR must be able to speak out. If you find that you have compromised in an organization, you might need to actually change where you work. Because once HR has compromised in terms of, you know, psychophancy, it's a little bit difficult for that same boss, that same CEO to trust the person. So if you get what I mean. So I think that that works. I hope that helps. Okay. So I have a, a funny question here. A funny situation, not a funny question. I have to be politically correct. So Yen Yen Mia says, please have a critical situation at hand. Two of my staff, man and woman, are dating. And this relationship has advanced to the stage where 
the lady confided in me that she's pregnant for the man. Our policy says no husband and wife can work in our organization. The greatest fear is the two are top performers and I don't want to lose any of the staff. What do I do? I don't think it is so much what you want or don't want at this point. There is an organizational policy and if they want to get married now, it could be that they don't want to get married. In that situation, your policy says they cannot be husband and wife. So if they are not planning to become husband and wife, then technically you don't have a problem because the, the policy says marriage, you see. So you can actually use a loophole in the policy. It doesn't say two people having a child together. It says marriage. So if they don't proceed to marry, that's the only situation I see. And this is me arguing like a lawyer now. That's the only situation I see where this policy does not apply to them. They can have the child, live together, do everything, but they are not married. And so you can keep your top performers. If, however, at any point in time, they do go and get married, then your policy stays and you would find other top performers. I see this a lot. People don't want the, the challenge of going to look for employees, but man, if, if, if they get married, then you might not have a choice but to let them go. Okay. Thank you so much for that feedback. I'm trying to understand, decipher, decode the question from so Chukwe, doing my first degree, but hope to be part of the successful team in my organization. My organization has about 11 branches in Lagos, and I totally understand that HR officers are not in the outlet. At the same time, and a lot of staff are to be under pressure, reporting to HR as an anonymous source. Is it the right thing for my passion to HR departments? Hmm. I don't understand the question only. You may need to refine, you may need to come to our level. Okay, you may need to come to our level. We are still taking questions. So Daniel has a question here. He says, this came to mind while I engaging this morning. Does exposure and experience of working in different working environments during one's career affect one's objectivity and makes a good leader? Uh, hmm. Okay, let me, so it's a tricky question and let me see why. First of all, so we have, I mean, we're all HR practitioners, so I, I know you understand what I'm saying. There's a minimum number of years that, that you stay with an organization within which it is perceived that you have actually impacted and you have actually gained from that organization. Most organizations is three, maximum five years. If this person we're talking about has just been hopping, and this is something I see in a lot of CVs, then one year, eight months, you hop. One year, two months, you hop. You haven't stayed long enough. So the first year you're learning, you're picking, you're learning, you're organizing. Second year, you start to make impact. Third year, you consolidate, then you can leave. So if what you're talking about is someone who has done that in many organizations, then yes, they would have gathered quite a worldview. And a worldview is always an asset. I tell people that the fact that I'm well-traveled is an asset. It does impact worldview. So you are able to engage at various levels. And also if you've worked in different types of organizations, you are also able to engage at various levels within the organization and in diverse industries. So building your career is not necessarily, um, should not necessarily be tunnel. It shouldn't even be tunnel. You should, so you practice HR in FMCG. You should be able to practice HR in hard industry as well. Practice HR in, HR in information technology as well. You know, at least understand the lingo, get it, get the skills that are necessary. It's important that you are able to practice human resource management in a diverse range of industries and across diverse ranges of roles. So some people have done L&D for 15 years. I'm, that may not make for you know a good hr career because you have tunneled you, you have tunneled yourself so try and not allow your career to be a tunnel you know try and be as broad as you can be and i'm not saying become jack of all trades and master of none everything that you pick make sure that you master it so that you can have a, an intelligent conversation about it and the business can actually benefit from whatever you know okay so i have a question here Itayo. And this person is saying that 
If you have worked for, say, about 10 years in the private sector, and then you transit to the public sector, <laughs> how do you manage the political uh, scenario and intensity in this particular environment, seeing that you have experience with public sector? Um, <laughs> okay, so um, this actually, I mean, is something that I've lived through. So the first thing is to recognize that whether private or public sector, human beings are human beings. And whatever you, whatever container you put them in, whatever structure you build around them, they will most likely adapt to that structure. The risk that I see a lot is that many of us move from private sector wanting to come and drive in the same way, with the same energy, with the same principles in the public sector, forgetting that the public sector engages in a different way, not necessarily less or even less professional. So that's a misconception that people have, that because it is public sector, so it's less professional. I once went on a course, a finance course with directors in the civil service, and we had an interesting conversation on our flight back. And I'm telling you, for like six hours, we engaged. It was, it was such an intelligent conversation. And that showed me that, oh, okay, they are in public service, but man, they are, you know. So the structure is what limits people. The, the, the bureaucracy, yes, let me not use the word structure. It's the bureaucracy that really limits them. It is not that you're coming to meet mediocre people. So I think that mindset needs to change and you need to come to the understanding that what you have to offer is what you have to offer. And you need to bring it to the table and find ways political intelligence comes to play to make sure that the best case scenario is what you work towards, not necessarily my, my best case scenario or my idea or how we did it in my last organization. But in this, you know, you, you don't take a baby who was crawling and say, well, he needs to start running. You, you, the baby needs to start standing first and then walking and then running. So you need to understand where the organization is. And that is part of emotional intelligence, understanding your audience and understanding where they are so that you can move them to the next level. When you transit from public, from private to public, you need to first make sure that you understand that these people are not less than you are. Many of them are very smart, very acute. They understand, but they work within a bureaucracy that has been created and is bigger than them. So you need to come and make sure you're not swallowed by the bureaucracy, but make sure that you can work with the bureaucracy to be able to advance the organization. So Ethiopia, bureaucracy is not necessarily bad. It's just a system that just can system. produce results if you can learn to manage it. Yes. Fantastic. So we have one or two questions here. I'll take them one after the other. Someone here says that I report to my director, but the CFO is more powerful in our company. There are some policies that I have come up with, but the CEO is afraid to approve it all because he's afraid of the CFO. Can I shift my loyalty to the CFO? <laughs> no, no, you shouldn't. Yeah, me, can I say that we have a um, successfully engaging with the CFO. The advanced HR group is hosting it tomorrow. So you might want to <laughs> advertise that for the people who are here so that they can attend that because this is actually a critical thing for HR and it happens across many organizations. The CFO does not understand why the CHRO or whoever is the most senior, yeah, CHRO, no matter what they're called, the CHRO is taking certain decisions. So let me tell you what happens. When you start to lobby, two things happen. The first is I think that you are lobbying because you really don't have a point. The second thing that could happen is that I think you are lobbying because you're trying to manipulate me. None of this moves you forward. So what you need to do is not lobby. What you need to do is justify. And a justification is not necessarily an emotional lobby. A justification with data, a justification with statistics is what you need to do. So instead of you know, having conversations, going to sit in the office, ah, please, sir, and those things don't work. Put together a graph. Put together a justification that nobody can reject and present it to the CFO. As this is my justification, I'm about, I'm about to present it to the CEO. Do you have any comments? And let the, let the CFO punch holes 
in it because when he critiques it, it helps you to go back and fine tune it. Don't be afraid for, uh, to be critiqued. Don't be afraid for your work to be assessed. Make sure that you allow your work to be assessed so that you can go back and fine tune it and put in the numbers that the CFO wants to see. But don't do this, the groveling. Don't, don't grovel, don't do it like you're begging. Do it like it is a business case for the organization. Sell it like that and it will sell even to the CFO. He wants profitability to increase. So, you know, you, you're, you're helping him. Fantastic. So just for the benefit of everyone on this call, I've dropped the invite and the link for tomorrow's session, successfully engaging with the office of the CFO is going to be 8 p.m. Please endeavor to attend. I dropped it in the chat. You can just copy it and you know, put in another platform where it will be readily accessible. Now I have another question, one or two questions here. Let me take one from Titi Lyo. And she says that, what do you do when all your efforts to meet up with your timeline on giving assignments is not being appreciated. Um, so that's a sentimental statement. I just pardon me, let me just hit it like that. Because when we say we want appreciation, honestly, I, I don't know what I, I'm not sure that applies in the workplace. Your appreciation is your pay. So you do work, you get paid. Anything else in addition? You're looking for extrinsic motivation and whether even in the world's best organizations, you might never get it. I've worked for a global organization. People don't even know who you are. Do you know, I mean, I remember going to attend a, a training in Portugal and somebody walked up to me that I had been working closely with for two years and we had never physically met. And you know, he was asking everybody, I'm looking for a Itai, I'm looking for Itai. And he came and said, my name is so and so. We've been working on the same team for two years. We've never met. So if you sit in the place that you want appreciation, you want appreciation because you can see this person. But the truth is that the organization hired you to do certain things, to deliver on certain things. Do deliver on them and then go home and sleep. Whether or not there is any kind of extrinsic motivation, you should be satisfied that you have delivered on your terms of employment and that at the end of the month you get paid and if somebody stands in the way of your getting paid that's a different conversation but honestly people have their own issues as well the ceo has his own issues you don't even know what he or she is dealing with at home so people have their own emotional challenges so you cannot walk around and be looking for you will never work you will never be productive because it's not all the time that you actually even engage so closely with somebody as to be appreciated. So if you move to a global organization, who's gonna appreciate you? They don't even know who you are. They just want to see your work. So make sure that you deliver on time because on-time delivery is helping you to build your career. It's not, the organization expects it. It's not something that you're doing extra. And if you do extra, extra, then the organization recognizes it. It's still not appreciation. It's still a recognition of what you have done. And even in an international organization, you can be recognized for what you have done. So I like to move the conversation from sentiment. So many times we get into the sentiment of, mm, he didn't even say thank you, but you're doing your job. This was what you were hired to do. So do your job and get on with it. Okay, thank you so much. Bodupe says, yeah, God bless you, Itayo. I have tried countless times to explain the inappropriateness in the use of appreciation. So I guess Mudupa is trying not to appreciate you. She now decided to bless you. <laughs> that is even of a higher weight and uh, consequent that. However, if you are the line manager, please, it is okay to appreciate people because it will motivate some of them, okay? But if you are the receiving and don't expect it, yes, you are being no, paid to serve. Then do do motivate people as much as you can, but yes. I mean don't don't go around expecting motivation. Fantastic. So there is a question here from a certain Yemi, not my own Yemi, but it's a very special Yemi. I think. He said that in a case where an organization have MD, CEO, and also have a global CHRO, now where there is a political tussle and the reporting line for HR is not clear. The CEO wants HR allegiance, same with the MD, 
and the global CHRO all differently. All three are not on the same page. HR gets query from all, if not following the instruction. All the three, they are what? Female. This is according to the other Yemi. Please advise. <laughs> Yemi, how am I sure that this is not you now? Eh? You don't want me to enter your matter. All right, so <laughs> first of all, um, you know, when I talked about dotted lines and thick lines and um, organizational structure, this question plays into that scenario that I was painting. Many times organizations are not able to manage dotted lines and thick lines properly. And this becomes a problem. If you are HR, well, in this case, you are HR, the best you can do is actually do an email and say that you want to understand the dotted line and the thick line, who am I reporting to? When they send you your line report, stay within your line reports. You can CC the others. It's okay to CC them because you have a dotted line to them and that's fine as well. But make sure you stay within your line report. You can never go wrong if you stay within your line. If you start to play the political game, then you get the queries because people are expecting you to play according to how they feel, according to how they think, and so on. So yeah, you will get into trouble. But if you maintain the, the organization, then even if you get into trouble, even if you're giving a query, you can answer objectively and you, you will not you know, suffer from it. I hope that helps. Thank you so much, Eitayo. Abdul Karim here says, thank you, Itayo. You are a powerful speaker. I love your depth and willingness to give from your wealth of knowledge. Thank you very much. Quite a number of people sharing encomiums uh, on you, you know. So let me see if we have additional questions here. We may be able to take one, two, or three more questions. Please send them in quickly. Richard, <laughs> that's a good one. <laughs> okay, waiting if I will get a thought to this question. Oh, one rest, eh? It's a Friday night. <laughs> okay. I can see people reaching out to their group leaders here. That's also good. Our energy is on point. Thank you. Thank you, Bukumi. How are you? I'm so I'm so excited. I have so many of my group, my group leaders. I mean, my group members here. Ah, this identity now. Wow. Hey. Oh, see my group members. Awesome. Thank you, people. Thank you. Thank you. Thank nice. God I'm a passive member of that group. <laughs> Can you imagine? Someone say, allow the speaker to go and rest. She has really tried. I don't know, only I mean, ah, ah, oh yeah, now. Okay. <laughs> it was an honor, really, truly an honor, always an honor to talk about these topics, always an honor to make impact. And um, okay, somebody asked a question. There's one more question. Yeah. Always an somebody honor. is saying, how do I connect with the speaker? This is my first time on the platform. Would you want to share maybe your contact, email or phone number, whatever you're comfortable in the chat group? I can put it there. So we are going to upload this session on our YouTube page. Okay, just give me a minute to call out our YouTube page. If I'm not mistaken, is the TCN HR on YouTube. If you just go to YouTube and you search for TCN HR, not only would you be able to get the video of today's session, but you also see videos of former sessions that we have had that you can listen to. Okay, so I had earlier dropped a Ethiopian link deal and do. I can look for it again and also share so that you can connect with Eitayo on LinkedIn. She will reach out back to you as soon as practicable. I'd like to thank everyone who has joined this session. I'd like to especially thank all the HR leaders from across various industries. I'd like to thank the HR leaders within the Covenant Nation HR Community Group. 
we do not take any of you for, for granted. Oh, I see a question. I think I'll read it. And this is from Oluagbe Meleke. And he or she says, I work with a faith-based, faith-based institution. My rector and registrar always at logger heads to control my unit in a faith-based organization. And the unit is HR. How can I handle the situation? Thank God you're a pastor. This is <laughs> This is political intelligence. And um, what you need to do is draw an organogram and get them to sign off on it. When you draw the organogram, make sure that you put HR exactly where you want to see HR and make sure that they sign off on it. Once they sign off on it, then pursue it and don't, don't, um, don't turn around from it. Don't differ from it, but they have to agree to it. So you have to politically manage it so that they agree to your organogram. But yes, you need to do an organogram and you have to keep it. Look, we say faith-based, but the truth is that people are still human beings as we started and um, human beings are what they are. So, you know, they are men, men first. And it's important to note that. I've dropped the uh, PDF. I hope that they'll be able to download it before you end the call. Yes, PDF. I, I will not end the session until they download it. Okay. Oh, okay. So someone is saying, how do I join TCA? Um, do you mean the Covenant Nation as a church or the TCA community group? Okay. But what, however, irrespective of whichever you mean, you can always look out for us on, on social media. You can go to insightforliving.org. You will see information about both the church and the Covenant Nation Community Group. Just to let you know that the Covenant Nation Community Group is a 12-week semester-based thing. And right now, you can't join because we are in week six. Okay, but in another six to eight weeks, this session semester will be over and new semesters will commence. And we have more than 100 different community groups. Okay, for example, there are nine different HR groups. So from HR veterans to HR you know, enthusiasts, we have different categories based on the different years of experience and exposure in, in HR. Okay, please check the chat group, the, the WhatsApp, the, the PDF, a PDF document was dropped by a Yita or EOT. The title is Emotional and Political Intelligence. And I have actually downloaded it myself. Okay, please check the, the chat group is there. Thank you so much for joining this evening. Also, many thanks to people who join every edition of this Open House Forum. We'll be having some more and um, very soon, next week, Sunday, we'll be having a, a special session around how to be an internal consultant in the HR space. Somebody from one of the top four will be coming to facilitate this session. And we have quite a number of exciting sessions, all free, available. However, you got the invite or the notification for today's program, I assure you that we will circulate the notice and the invite for upcoming programs. And also, by the time the next semester for the HR community group is coming up, I undertake to also circulate the information through the various um, HR platforms so that you may elect to join, or you may also share and refer people who may benefit from this program. I would like to specially thank the entire your team for gracing this occasion. We do not take this for granted. We'd like to thank over 110 people at one point or the other who joined this call. We'd like to say that, please make good use of the information you have had today. Let it make the necessary adjustments on your job. Make the necessary adjustments in your relationships, in your network, so that the optimum value obtained from today's teaching session will be manifest in your career. Thank you so much. Continue to reach out to, to our on, on LinkedIn and continue to reach out to, to one another. We have less than three more minutes on this call. I would like to sign out and end with some music, but I will still not 
close out the session just in case one or two people want to download the slide for today. I also dropped my phone number just in case anybody wants to private chat me. So I'm dropping my phone number. Maybe I have one inquiry or the other about the Covenant Nation or the Covenant Nation Community Group. You can send me a WhatsApp message. Okay, what I will do is I will reattach the PDF documents in a bit. Let's just say that the grace of God will shine upon us. His countenance will be heavy on us. The mercies and blessings of God will be upon us. Please stay safe. If you are still in transit, join your mercies. If you are at home, warm regards to your family. May the blessings of God be upon you. Thank you for joining. We appreciate you and we love you. Keep flourishing. God bless you.